From an Iraq war cover-up to towns ravaged by opioids to the roots of our modern immigration crisis, Embedded explores what's been sealed off and undisclosed. NPR's original investigative podcast reveals why these stories and the people behind them matter. Listen to the Embedded podcast only from NPR. Support for this show comes from Alpine Bank. 50 years young, 20 years green. Proud to support Parched from Colorado Public Radio. Learn more about Alpine Bank's history of community service and its green team at alpinebank.com. Support for Parched comes from Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, whose mission is to deepen understanding and promote conservation of alpine plants and fragile mountain environments. Learn how to support these efforts at bettyfordalpinegardens.org. I'm riding shotgun in an off-roading vehicle. It looks like a souped-up golf cart made for steep dirt trails instead of putting greens. James Eklund is driving. He's a tall guy wearing a collared shirt and a fancy, clean, off-white cowboy hat. We're driving across grazing fields for cattle. It's fall, and the trees shimmer orange and yellow in the wind. Mountain views surround this ranch in western Colorado. James hops out to unlock a metal gate. And then suddenly, we're surrounded by cattle. These are uh, black Angus, mostly. (laughs) And we have a ditch that irrigates this property, and we raise hay grass with a little bit of alfalfa in it. When I look at the ground right now, it's pretty green. And that's because of the water that's flood irrigating? Yes. uh, We try and hit our dry spots as efficiently as we can, but it is flood irrigation. Over the last few episodes, we've been thinking about what cities can do to use less water. And that's important and empowering for those of us who live in those cities. But here's the reality. Despite the fact that the Southwest is now packed with tens of millions of people, cities aren't using most of the Colorado River. Farming and ranching sucks up around 80% of what flows through the river. People like James water fields to grow cattle feed in Colorado, or broccoli in Arizona, or lettuce in California. More than 5 million acres spread across the southwest and into northern Mexico use up the majority of the Colorado River. If you draw a line down the middle of the country, pretty much like smack dab through the middle of Kansas and Nebraska, that's the 100th meridian. And everything to the west of that line has to be irrigated in order for it to grow. So that's why I'm here surrounded by Black Angus in Colburn, Colorado, to talk to James on his family's ranch. If there's any chance of us getting out of this water crisis, farmers and ranchers will need to be the biggest part of the solution. It's likely they'll need to use a lot less water. But getting farmers and ranchers to conserve isn't an easy thing. Western water law is designed to protect older ag operations from having to give up water. There are also use-it-or-lose-it laws that threaten to take water away from farmers and ranchers in the Southwest if they stop using water to grow food or raise livestock. We've really got to give more optionality to ag producers, and at the same time put water into a river system that's just desperately needing it. James's family has been using the Colorado River to run this ranch for more than 130 years. And now, James wants the option to make a profit another way, which could help out the water crisis. He wants state and federal dollars to go to farming and ranching families like his, so they are paid to use less water. Doing that will leave more water in the river to benefit everyone in the Southwest. I am a big believer in 
the power and innovation of agricultural producers to get that job done. I'm not such a big fan of hoping for rain. But the Colorado River is the foundation southwestern agricultural communities are built on. So some farmers and ranchers see this idea as a threat to their livelihoods and identity, especially if water itself, instead of the food it can grow, becomes the more profitable commodity. From Colorado Public Radio, this is Parched, a podcast about people who rely on the river that shaped the West and have ideas to save it. I'm Michael Elizabeth Sackis. We use the Colorado River to grow a lot of food. Farmers and ranchers here are nourishing people across the country and the world. Here, farmers can grow alfalfa in the desert year-round. That goes to dairy cows. And it means all of us get a reliable supply of milk to satisfy cheese pizza, nacho, and latte cravings around the country. The long growing cycle of desert farming is why people in cities from coast to coast have lettuce and other vegetables on the shelves of our grocery stores in the dead of winter. It doesn't matter if you're eating that salad in Colburn or Denver or New York City. That's a very big input to any restaurant, any grocery store. You can imagine going to your local grocery store and not being able to get iceberg or romaine or arugula, green leaves to eat. So the vast majority of Colorado River water goes to our plates. But now the Colorado River is in crisis. So the states and the federal government are looking to ag to cut back on water use. And that has James worried. If this water crisis gets bad enough and Lake Mead, the country's largest reservoir, continues to plummet, James is afraid families, like his, will be forced to give up their water. That those laws in place to supposedly protect him won't anymore if there's a chance city taps could go dry. That would threaten the health and safety of millions of people, and farms could be forced to give up water to avoid that. Instead, James would rather volunteer now to stop using some of his water and get paid. That's actually on the table as a solution, because, at least for now, farmers control most Colorado River water, and that control is passed down through generations. So we're going to head to the head gate now? Yeah. We've left the field for an overgrown dirt trail. Branches hit me in the face and shoulder as we drive alongside an irrigation ditch. We stop where the ditch meets a stream, which is legally Colorado River water. A ditch like this in the 1880s would have had to be dug by hand, and people would have showed up with their team of horses or their their shovels or, you know, whatever they could do to help dig this ditch. One of those people was James's great-great-grandfather, Ole Gunderson moved here from a small Norwegian town. After he was blinded from a mining explosion, he immigrated to the U.S. to start this ranch. Ole's young sons had to help him hunt to survive as the family built their homestead here in Colorado. My grandfather would carry the musket, and then he would get down on all fours, and his boys would lay that musket across his back and shoot the elk. So, I think it's a great story. This story about great-great-grandpa Oli helps explain why most Colorado river water goes to farming and ranching. As Europeans forced indigenous people off this land, 
they dug irrigation ditches to feed crops and grow food. In the eyes of the law, that secured only the protected right to keep using a certain amount of Colorado River water forever. These are the laws that shield some farmers and ranchers from having to give up water in the face of climate change. So if Ole comes into this valley where we're standing and puts his shovel in any of the creeks around here, then he has an 1888 water right. If somebody comes along, and people did, after him, even if they're upstream of him, they have to let all their water go past to satisfy Ole's right before they can take a drop. It seems a little strange, but that's how water rights work in the West. It's like a complicated system of calling dibs. Since Ole's water right is from 1888, the law says he's protected from newcomers who take from this same stream. Ole gets first dibs on this water. Then the guy with the second oldest water right gets second dibs, and so on. The newest guy? He often goes without water. And that water right is valuable, and it's often passed down to family, like James. You turn the water out of the ditch, it floods the field, and then you plug that hole that you created in your ditch and move down a, a little ways, and you pop another hole, and you, you flood another section of your field. And that's the way we've done it. And that's the way Ole did it. That's the way everybody's done it since, you know, 1888. But what if 130 years later, in the era of climate change, James started to use that water another way? What if instead he was paid to leave that water he has rights to in the river, to let it flow all the way down from Colorado to Lake Powell, the second largest reservoir in the country, at the Arizona-Utah border. Together, Lake Powell and Lake Mead downstream work as a water bank for the entire Southwest. That water savings account protects tens of millions of us from dry years. So in order to avoid the contents of Lake Powell declining to a crisis level, we need to put water in that bucket. This is a manner and mechanism that can actually change the levels of that reservoir. Because you're talking about 80 to 90 percent of use in the basin being in agriculture, it really has to be an agriculture-led solution to the problem of declining reservoirs. James is standing where the ditch Ole dug meets the stream. Here, there's a tall metal contraption called a headgate. They're kind of hard to describe. A head gate looks like a guillotine. <laughs> it has a slotted structure that the gate sits in, and it can literally be cranked open or cranked shut by a, turning a wheel on the top of the device. I mean, guillotine's pretty close. Guillotine. Like, I, I think... <laughs> Doesn't it look like a guillotine? It's a sheet of metal that opens and closes vertically. James would be willing to crank down the metal slab and stop the water from rushing down the ditch to irrigate his fields. But... It's really important for agriculture to be compensated for this kind of activity because when I ratchet down that headgate we're looking at, it means I'm not growing something. And... That means I'm not making as much money as my business requires me to make, or that I uh, normally count on making. So farmers could give up some of their water as long as they can still make an income. James is eager to set up a program like this, in part to address the water crisis, and because if the crisis gets too severe, farmers and ranchers could be forced to give up their water and might get nothing in return. The people I've talked to are quite nervous that if nothing is done, you can forget about distributed pain. All of the pain will be borne by agriculture. So it sounds like you are taking this on. You're trying to make some change. Can you tell us 
what you're doing. Partially born out of frustration, but I'd say more so born out of my kind of eternal optimism that we can control our own destiny in the Colorado River Basin. I'm, I'm running around the state every chance I get, any person I can talk to that's in agriculture about this in the hope that a critical mass, a chorus of voices uh, can kind of rise up and implore the state to act. The states. For his plan to work, he needs states or the federal government to offer up money. Over the last several years, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming have been considering it. All of them would need to agree on it to move forward together. James has been trying to help them along. He started a petition and set out to get farmers and ranchers to sign up and show the states that they want a program like this. There was no forum that the state was continuing for me to go make my case at a podium or at a conference. So I just came up with an instrument on my own. And that petition is hopefully being circulated around. I would count it a massive success if, even if not very many people sign it, that it spurs the state to act. That's the point. And I hope that's the case. One place that James went to drum up support is a farming and ranching mainstay in my home state, the Colorado State Fair. The hot September weather here in Pueblo, Colorado, clearly hasn't kept the crowds away. I'm dodging people left and right who are holding turkey legs and cotton candy. There are rides too scary for me to get on, like the Hammer, the Scrambler. There are rodeos and livestock auctions and horse riding competitions. This fair is older than Colorado itself. It started in the late 1800s to celebrate agriculture. I almost follow the enticing smell of funnel cake to its origins, but then I focus. I'm looking for James. And then finally, in this sea of cowboy hats, I find him. And he's wearing his crisp white Stetson. I'm showing you on my cowboy hat right here a Centennial Farms Colorado pin that you get when you when you have a, a ranch or a farm that's been around that long. With all the farmers and ranchers gathered here, James sees the Colorado State Fair as a perfect place to find people to sign his petition. I feel like a old-time preacher that would go from like town to town and try and spread the good word and the gospel. And for me, it is water. Hey, John. It's good to see you, my man. Michael Elizabeth. Hello. I'm Michael. I'm with Colorado Public Radio. Okay, good. John Singletary is a semi-retired rancher with a career history in state water issues. And he's just the kind of person James wants to talk to about paying ranchers to use less water. John and James have worked together in the past. This guy knows more about the Colorado River than John Wesley Powell. (laughs) We go on a walk around the state fair to find a shady spot to chat. Uh, They say that smell is the the closest tie to memory. And... You catch smells here that I, I, I haven't smelled in any other place. <laughs> it's, a, it's like makes me feel at home. Yeah. Kettle corn and yeah, it's like a uh, little <laughs> cow manure. Yep. James explains his petition to John, and John likes the idea of paying farmers to use less water to protect the Colorado River and all those who rely on it. We got to help each other, and that's where that's where James is trying to bring us all together right now. We got to help each other. We got a problem. We got to have a strong, strong voice to make sure we're protected, but we also got to be thoughtful about how it works. Because if it doesn't work, we're going to lose eventually. James has been pushing for this program for years. 
long before his petition, he did it on a stage bigger than any you'll find at the state fair. See, James is not just a rancher. He's also a water lawyer, and he used to be Colorado's top water policy official. Several years ago, he was in charge of working with Colorado's neighbors to figure out how the states could use less water. And he pushed for this idea of paying farmers back then. When he left that job, he thought the states were on track to create a program. If they had, there could be extra water stored in Lake Powell right now because water savings on farms means more water for the whole system. Instead, James is trying another way. He's talking to farmers one at a time to get the next signature on his petition. If there's a way to demonstrate interest, let's do that. And my hope is that by accumulating enough of those people, put, basically putting their hand in the air and saying, I'm interested in this, if, if the price is good enough. We gotta start somewhere. But doing something that could change the economics of farming in the Southwest is creating tension among farmers themselves. That's after the break. Hi, I'm Rebecca Romberg. I help make this podcast and lots of other shows at Colorado Public Radio. If you're enjoying Parched and you're thinking about what to listen to next, we've got some suggestions. Terra Firma explores the great outdoors. Robin's song is the sound my great-grandmothers and their great-grandmothers knew. Ghost Train looks at how to make public transportation work better. If we really want a better city, a better world, we have to change. My Story So Far is a podcast where people share their personal stories live and on stage. I don't want to bash my father's cooking, but there was no enchiladas, there was no rice, not even any beans. Like, come on. Find these shows in your favorite podcast app or visit CPR.org slash podcasts. Support for this show comes from Alpine Bank. 50 years young, 20 years green. Proud to support Parched from Colorado Public Radio. Learn more about Alpine Bank's history of community service and its green team at alpinebank.com. Support for Parched comes from Colorado State Fire Service. In Colorado, living alongside nature is a way of life. That includes preparing homes for wildfire. Learn how simple actions can help people prepare for wildfire at livewildfireready.org. About 50 miles west of James's ranch is a wide expanse of cornfields. This is the Grand Valley of Colorado, where the Rocky Mountains meet the desert. Joe Bernal is the farmer of these fields. He's actually tried James's idea. A few years back, Joe participated in a pilot where farmers and ranchers were paid to use less water. When he drives up to meet me, Joe is wearing a flannel shirt under a tan vest with thick-rimmed hipster glasses and a cap that says Bernal Farms. I am a lifelong resident of the Grand Valley. I was born and raised here. My father was born and raised here. We use the farmland we own and the farmland we rent and Colorado's water and sunshine to produce food. I am a uh, lifetime agriculture producer. We produce uh, wheat for milling. We produce feed corn. We produce alfalfa and we produce grass and also cattle, beef cattle. I'd love to hear your family's story of how you ended up here being farmers and ranchers. My great-grandparents were born in uh, Conejos, Colorado. They came here to work in the sugar beet industry and short time after that bought a farm and began raising sugar beets themselves. My brother works with us and several other family members, in-laws, cousins, nephews. And I think part of it's because of our Latino heritage. That heritage um, dictates a lot of closeness. 
I think that's one of the one of the more admirable or the more enjoyable things about our lifestyle. Joe says it was never a question for him whether or not he would keep the family business going. He says farming is the one thing he wants to do. This gorgeous fall day is a harvesting day. There's a massive combine sitting nearby in a cornfield. Joe and I climb up a ladder to get in the combine to start harvesting corn. Okay, Mike, you ready to go? Yeah. Watch your step. Come this way. Come that way, great. Joe helps me get all my stuff up into the passenger seat. Okay, what can you hand me? You can grab that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And then maybe the water bottle. Once me and all my reporting gear make it inside, Joe empties the corn he already harvested into the back of a truck. Okay, that was about um, 12,000 pounds of corn, 300 bushel of corn. And what did you say it was gonna be used for? This, uh, uh, particular buyer is using it for beef production. Okay, this is going to be a really dumb question if you've never heard this song, but have you heard the viral It's Corn song? It's this little kid talking about corn and how much he loves corn. No, I haven't. What do you like about <laughs> corn? It's cold! A big loaf it knobs, it has to do. It is, uh, been stuck in my head since I've been watching mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of pounds of corn. <laughs> <laughs> dumped into the truck. <laughs> Once the combine is empty, Joe starts moving slowly through the field to collect another load. This is how his family has used Colorado River water for decades. But just a few years ago, Joe agreed to get paid to leave some of his fields bare. That's called fallowing. Instead, that water stayed in the river. But he's cautious of what fallowing on a much larger scale could do to his community or any other agricultural community in the Southwest. We're proud of our community and, and we want to protect our way of life. And we want to have the opportunity to continue our way of life. And we don't want this community and its resources to be mined, to be taken from, offered a, a high price and, and be offered to be to sell them. We look at, at our water as our biggest resource that adds the value or the beauty or the, or the desire to live here in the Grand Valley. So to look at the uh, idea of, of, of just taking money that could possibly hurt this community we're very very wary of and we want to look at the opportunity and and look at it and and look at the consequences for ourselves for our neighbors and the businesses here joe says james's idea can work and that if the price is right farmers will give up some of their water but he wants farmers to keep growing as much food as they can and also, I think it's important that, that people understand what we do with this water. We make food. I like pizza. I like cheese on my pizza. Uh, our alfalfa, our grass goes, our, our corn goes to make, goes to dairies to make, to make milk, to make cheese, to make foods that we all enjoy. I, I, I can't emphasize enough that we use water to make food. Joe wants there to be careful rules on who can participate and how much water they can lease to try to lessen the impacts of farmland going dry and drying up economies in those communities. Because there are lots of other local businesses that rely on farming. Joe also emphasizes that the program needs to be voluntary so each farmer can decide what makes sense for them. On the plus side, Joe says taking money to fallow fields would allow him to invest in his whole operation. Land improvement, 
irrigation system improvement. Also, maybe infrastructure. Those, those opportunities could also come about if you were farming a little less ground. So Joe sees an upside for himself and the river to the idea of paying farmers to use less water. But he also worries about the impacts to some farming and ranching communities if water itself becomes the commodity instead of crops and livestock. And he has real personal reasons to be worried about that. Joe doesn't own this farmland that he's harvesting. He leases it to grow food. The owner of these fields is actually a private Wall Street investment firm. The company is called Water Asset Management, and they've bought millions of dollars worth of land in Western Colorado. How do I feel the landlord is a hedge fund? Well, we in, in the United States have the opportunity to buy land and do what we want with it. So far, so good is what I say. The thing that I will recognize about water asset management is they have kept large blocks of ag land in ag production. Most of the places or all the places that they purchase here in the Grand Valley are being farmed by local farmers. The company, Water Asset Management, is now one of the largest landowners in the Grand Valley. In an interview in 2020, the company's co-founder and president called water a trillion-dollar market opportunity. Their goal is to make farms more efficient so they can profit off leasing water they no longer need. On their website, the company says clean water is the resource defining this century, much like plentiful oil defined the last. And here's where Joe Bernal and James Eklund are connected in a surprising way. Because James Eklund, the water lawyer and rancher, who wants Colorado River farmers to show the states and the federal government that they want options to lease their water, he represents Water Asset Management, the same Wall Street firm that owns the farm that Joe leases. And the company is poised to profit off programs where they can lease their water in times of drought. Programs like the one James is pushing for. James, the rancher and water lawyer, has tried to convince Joe to sign the petition. But Joe doesn't like that James represents a company that sees profits in farm water. I asked Joe about James's petition. I have heard about it and I'm in not support of it. I don't look at this as an opportunity to get rich. We look at this as an opportunity to uh, be participants in the solution of the crisis uh, on the Colorado River. And if they provide some economic bonus for the landowners and the water rights holders, I think that's good. But I would be cautious of creating a windfall for our community that could disrupt the continuity of our ag system. You really don't want to scrap something and then in two years turn around and go look for it and say, well, where did I scrap that? Well, that's, that's, our, ag, that's our ag economy, that's our ag producers, that's our, our owner and renter relationships. Those are the things we want to maintain. on James Eklund's family's ranch. We're sitting in wooden chairs on the porch as the sun is starting to set. I asked James about these concerns that Joe Bernal and others have about private companies like Water Asset Management buying up farmland to profit off water in times of drought. James says the company's goal is to keep agriculture in production. And if they can make farming more efficient, and profit off the water the land doesn't need, James sees that as an investment in the future of farming in the West and a safeguard for the rest of us who 
who rely on the Colorado River. I guess my biggest beef with this whole criticism of me or water asset management is, well, do you discourage, do you want to discourage investment in Colorado agriculture as a sector? I don't think you would find any business leader, chamber of commerce, economic development official or participant criticizing or trying to dissuade money from anywhere in America, Wall Street, private equity, venture capital, you name it, angel investors, family offices, institutional investors like pension funds. And I hear, well, water's different. It's, it's uh, you know, farmland and water, agriculture is different. Well, tell me how, and we can have that conversation. But, you know, I'm sitting with you here on my ranch, and this is a business, and we have to operate it as such. If somebody wants to invest in this place, you better believe I'm going to have that conversation. So, where do things stand with paying farmers and ranchers to use less water? There's been a lot of movement recently. The federal government plans to put millions and possibly billions of dollars into the idea, recognizing that it has to be one of the solutions for the Colorado River. Farmers and ranchers use around 80% of the Colorado River. So most of the water that's needed to get us out of this crisis has to come from agriculture. But the money they've made available so far is temporary. It's a one-off. And most of it is currently going to Arizona, California, and the tribes there. As for the upstream states in the Rocky Mountains, they've agreed to a version of a program to pay ranchers for their water. That means James has set aside his petition effort. But he's still not satisfied. He doesn't think Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming are going far enough. He says farmers would have to be paid more for the idea to really work. It also doesn't ensure the farmer's water flows down to the critically low reservoirs. The states recently decided they wouldn't go that far for now. If they move forward, it could mean a lot more water to go around, but less water for farming. There are ways to do both though, save water and keep growing food in a profitable way. We visit an indigenous farmer who's trying to do just that, to grow the same amount of food while using less Colorado River water. I think that the tribe's role in this moment is really that of almost a caretaker in the sense that, you know, this river has sustained us for so long and for generations and it's, it's at the core of us. I think it's our role also to make sure that, that we, we do everything that we can to protect it. That's next time on Parched. Hey, it's Michael. Thanks for listening to Parched. I have another show I know you'll love. Ghost Train is about an ambitious plan for commuter rail in Colorado, how it got sidetracked, and where Denver and other cities might go from here. It's a question facing cities across the country. Find Ghost Train wherever you get your podcasts. Support for Parched comes from Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, whose mission is to deepen understanding and promote conservation of alpine plants and fragile mountain environments. Learn how to support these efforts at bettyfordalpinegardens.org. Hey, Parched listeners. As climate change forces a water reckoning in the West, we're experiencing different water woes on our coastlines as sea levels rise. And the people living on the coast are on the front lines of it all. I don't think there's any scientist in the United States that doesn't agree that if something's not done, we're gone. From WWNO and WRKF comes a new podcast called Sea Change. Listen to Sea Change wherever you get your podcasts.